Welcome back to Debunking Iraqi Forgot. Part 5 is one of the most popular parts, and as such, it also has some of the most criticism. The Western JoJo fanbase has had a tumultuous history with this part, and it is very divisive to say the least. In Japan, however, it is one of, if not the most, well-liked part. I imagine this divide resulted from the extremely poor English translation Part 5 was stuck with for many years. But even now, when a much better translation has come about, people have continued to push the same things they've been complaining about since back then. Part 5 is introduced to us by Koichi, who has been sent to Italy by Jotaro to investigate Giorno. For whatever reason, his inclusion is confusing to people, who think that Josuke should have been sent instead. It has been shown that Jotaro considers Koichi very reliable, in a chapter that came out a mere 20 days before Part 5 started. It is also directly stated by Jotaro that Koichi would be better suited to approach Giorno without being noticed. Back in Part 3, Jotaro experienced firsthand that he and Joseph could sense Jonathan's body nearby. If he or Josuke went to approach Giorno, it is very possible that they would be sensed by him as well. Some people have asked how Giorno got a hold of the spirit photograph that Joseph took of Dio. However, this is an error that exists only in the anime adaptation, since the manga uses a completely different picture. In Giorno's fight against Bruno, he uses an ability that involves overcharging a target with life energy. This makes them lose control of their consciousness and experience pain much slower than normal. Many have asked why this ability does not return in Giorno's later fights. The first thing to be made clear is that this ability only works when directly punching a living target. It does not work on stands, which is directly shown in the fight with Black Sabbath, which is an automatic remote stand. Three of Giorno's fights are against targets that would be unaffected. Black Sabbath, the remote independent stand Babyface, and the userless stand Notorious B.I.G. Against Gyacho, Giorno's attacks are completely blocked by the suit of ice, and only the metal pole entering through his air vent could damage him. In the fights where Giorno does attack a stand user directly, they are defeated immediately afterwards. There is no reason not to believe that the effects of the punch are still felt by Chocolata and Diavolo. They're just not shown, since they have already been shown in great detail twice before. Some people have also suggested that Gold Experience Requiem's ability is somewhat of an evolution of this consciousness attack. Another Gold Experience ability that is seen less later on is Damage Reflection. This is first seen happening to Luca, and later on, Koichi and Bruno. Many ask why this did not happen later. In Giorno's other fights, no enemies ever directly attack a gold experience creation. Chocolata's mold would not count as a direct attack, since it is happening independently from Green Day itself. Some point to Diavolo killing the Scorpion, however this is another error only present in the anime. In the manga, Diavolo specifically avoids touching the Scorpion by removing a chunk of his own flesh, similar to the rat fight in Part 4. Others ask why the body parts created by Giorno don't have this effect when they're damaged. After a certain amount of time, the body parts must end up being considered part of the person they're attached to. Also, the way Giorno describes this ability early on is the organism protecting itself. This would imply that an incomplete organism would not have this ability. When Pulpo is first introduced, he is shown eating his own fingers before they are seemingly healed. Many people ask what the purpose of this was. Some people have suggested that the meta reason for this being included would be a reference to the guitarist for Black Sabbath, who famously lost some of his fingers in an accident. Black Sabbath also being the name of Pulpo's stand. The in-universe explanation would be that this is the activation for his stand, since immediately after doing this, the lighter appears from nowhere into his hand. The stand Craftwork's ability is to fix objects together. He's often shown using this to stop bullets from hitting him. Some people ask how he was able to freeze the bullet in the air when he's on a moving truck. This is a blatant misunderstanding of his ability, since for whatever reason, people assume that things are frozen statically. He actually uses Kraftwerk to fix things relative to the truck, including Mista's hand which was stuck onto the railing. The bullets were fixed relative to himself, who was also moving along with the truck. Back in Part 3, Kakuin discerned that Hanged Man's ability did not involve moving into a mirror world, and that the true form of the stand must be made of light bouncing between reflections. In Part 5, the stand's man in the mirror can take its targets into a mirror dimension. 
This has been part of a long-running joke in the JoJo community that even predates the 2012 anime. Even I have a video on my own channel poking fun at this. However, some people take this far too seriously, and honestly suggest that these two events are actually contradictory. Hanged Man was a stand that appeared to be completely invincible. If it actually attacked from a mirror world, it would be unstoppable. Kakuen knew there must be a catch, which is how he figured out the stand's true nature. Man in the Mirror cannot attack directly from the mirror. It has to bring its targets inside first. It is also shown to not be very physically strong, as a trade-off for its very powerful ability. Illuso mentions that stands can interact with people, but not the other way around. Shortly after this, he is shown touching Moody Blues and interacting with it. This is another error only present in the anime, since in the manga, he is still touching Abakio himself. Some people have asked how Mista was able to survive his gunshot wounds before Giorno had learned the ability to heal. I don't see how people can really be surprised by this, when the entire point of the scene was that number 5 stopped the bullets before they could enter Mista's head, only leaving him with perfectly treatable surface injuries. After the Grateful Dead fight, an indentation in the ground is shown next to Trish as a hint that she is a stand user. Many people say that this is contradictory to the ability of her stand, which is the soft in objects and that this indentation did not appear again. That isn't necessarily true, since it actually does appear again shortly before she awakens her stand. This indentation could simply be caused by her subconsciously softening the ground. After Bruno is defeated by King Crimson, Giorno is shown making a second Coco Jumbo, which still has access to its stand ability. Some people have asked how this is possible, and why Giorno did not make more creatures with stands. Giorno specifically says that he made this turtle using the cells of the original. If Coco Jumbo is a born stand user, then an exact copy grown from his cells would be also. King Crimson is a stand that has a large amount of debate surrounding it. Early translations of Part 5 were extremely poor, so a common joke among Western fans pertained to how confusing the countless mistranslations made his ability. However, even with more accurate translations coming out in recent years, people still say that King Crimson's ability is contradicting itself. I will go over these apparent contradictions and show how they are a misunderstanding of the stand's ability. The most common claim made about King Crimson is that it is inconsistent whether Diavolo can interact with objects within skipped time. Against Risotto, bullets are seen phasing through him, but elsewhere, he is seemingly interacting with objects. It is important to note that we are never actually shown King Crimson interacting with an object in skipped time. These only ever happen when skipped time is not shown to us. In Jojo Veller, it is clarified that King Crimson is unable to attack in skipped time. This makes sense, since Diavolo is always shown waiting until immediately after a skip to launch a sneak attack. However, people point to things such as Narancha's death or Trish being taken from the elevator as examples of King Crimson interacting in skipped time. The most important thing to understand about King Crimson is how fate is manipulated by its ability, and how this interacts with his substand Epitaph. Diavolo can view a forecast of 10 seconds into the future with Epitaph. The prediction of these 10 seconds is absolute, it is fated to happen. However, skipping time allows Diavolo to be exempt from fate for up to 10 seconds, so he's able to move as he pleases during a skip. But just because Diavolo does something different, that would not change the fated actions of everyone else. Everything around him is still fated to carry out the same exact movements, even results of actions Diavolo was fated to do. This is how these various events are able to happen. Diavolo waits until Epitaph shows him a favorable prediction, and then skips time to allow this to happen with no risk to him afterwards. Epitaph being bound to fate prevents him from constantly abusing this, since Diavolo cannot control what will appear from Epitaph. When a prediction is shown to not be in his favor, he instead uses this opportunity to move into a favorable position and prepare a counterattack. In the example of Narancha's death, Narancha is fated to become impaled on the bars. Since King Crimson is only able to change Diavolo's fate, this event will still occur no matter what. The only things unbound by fate during a skip are Diavolo himself and anything that is an extension of himself. This includes his own blood, which he is seen manipulating to appear in front of a target's face as soon as the skip ends. He has also been shown launching attacks from within a skip, which are timed to hit immediately after time returns to normal. While Bucciarati is fighting King Crimson for the first time, he sees a vision of his future actions. 
People are often confused by this, and use it as an example of something that was forgotten. However, Diavolo explains that he is showing him Epitaph's ability. Normally, Diavolo displays this projection behind his bangs, but in this case, he has projected it in front of Bucciarati. After Bucciarati is defeated by Diavolo, he is left to die and is found by Giorno. He heals his body as soon as his soul is leaving, and he is able to come back to life. Many people have asked how this is possible, and say that this is a contradiction of Jotaro's statement in Part 4 about how no standability is able to resurrect the dead. This is a topic that I've had to go over in multiple videos, but now that we've finally reached this video, I can cover it in full. Jotaro's quote is still correct. No standability is capable of bringing a person back from the dead. Plenty of stands are capable of perfectly healing a body, but that is not a guarantee that that person's soul will return. Whether or not a soul can come back is completely up to their own resolve. In Part 3, Joseph returned to his body after it had blood again. In Part 4, Okuyasu was able to turn away from the afterlife and return to his body. And in Part 5, Bucciarati was able to occupy his body again. However, Bucciarati is a special case. As seen in Sleeping Slaves, he was fated to die from his fight with King Crimson. Through sheer resolve, he was able to pilot his body for a short time. He was shown being unaware of pain and lacking any feeling of hunger, and eventually his body had deteriorated to the point of him going blind and deaf after only a couple of days. After Giorno and Bucciarati decide to betray the boss, the rest of the team must choose whether to join them or stay behind. All of them join except for Fugo, who is absent for the rest of the part. Numerous people have said that Fugo was forgotten about by Araki, or that he was written out as a result of being too powerful. Neither of these are true. Araki has spoken at length about Fugo in an interview. He said that his original plan was to have Fugo acting as a spy, who would betray the group and end with him being killed. Due to his depression at the time, Araki decided this was too much and had him leave the group instead. This change had nothing to do with the power of his stand, and was a conscious choice by Araki as an end for the character in this story. The stand talking head attaches itself to a target and forces them to say the opposite of what they mean to say. Many people ask why Bucciarati did not use his liar tasting technique, as shown when he met Giorno. Some people have suggested that this was only used as an intimidation tactic, and that it does not literally detect lies. That is actually wrong, since Bruno's inner monologue confirms that he is actually able to do this. However, that does not stop this point from being incorrect. For starters, Bruno did not have any suspicion that Narancia was lying, so he would never consider doing this. Second, Narancia is not intentionally lying, so his sweat would not indicate that. When Trish's stand Spice Girl is first introduced, it acts independently and speaks to Trish similar to Echo's Act 3 and Sex Pistols. However, after this fight, Trish is shown directly controlling her stand, and the stand no longer speaks. I have seen some people say that Araki forgot about Spice Girl's independent personality and its ability to speak. I don't see how people can miss this one, since Spice Girl made it very clear that she did not have an individual personality. She is a representation of Trish's own more confident personality that she was hiding from the group, and once Trish gained control of her stand, she accepted who she really was. Spice Girl tells Trish that they have become one and the same, so the stand acting on its own is no longer necessary. Some people have asked why Diavolo did not reveal himself during the fight with Rosato to have an easier chance of defeating him. This is another example of people simply not paying attention, since Diavolo goes over this possibility. The goal of the fight was to get close enough to Rosato to damage him and to learn his ability. Diavolo directly states that if he is too far away and reveals himself, Rosato would just run away after learning the boss's face. Many people have asked why Giorno did not revive Abakio and Narancia in the same way he did for Bruno despite Bruno being a special case where he had the resolve to return. This also stems from people completely forgetting the fact that Bruno was not really alive, but was just controlling a deteriorating corpse. A common question I've seen involves the fight against Green Day. People ask how Chocolata was able to cut sex pistols with a scalpel when physical objects are not able to interact with stands. I have no idea how this became so common when such a thing was never shown happening in the first place. We never saw the attack that injured Sex Pistols. We see a bloody scalpel on the table, but on the very next page, we see Chocolata attacking Giorno with his stand, which could easily have been the way Sex Pistols was damaged. 
And almost immediately after this, the true purpose of the scalpel was shown, with Chocolata using it to cut himself up to hide inside of the helicopter. This was how he was able to get the drop on Sex Pistols in the first place. In Diavolo's backstory, his birth is shown to have been an impossible occurrence, resulting from a two-year-long pregnancy with no apparent father. People have repeatedly asked how this is possible. I don't see how people can miss the point of this scene. These events are clearly presented as an impossible urban legend, and are not meant to be understood. The details of Diavolo's past are left intentionally vague to show how well his past has been hidden. The apparently supernatural circumstances surrounding his birth are also quite fitting considering his demonic namesake. During Polnareff's flashback, it is mentioned that Jotaro and Polnareff investigated the Stand Arrows in the 1990s. I have seen a ton of people asking how this is possible, when Jotaro is shown learning about the Arrow's power during Part 4 in 1999. However, it was shown in Part 4 that Jotaro was aware of the Arrows beforehand, since he was in possession of the photograph of Enya with the Arrow, which he says was found over 10 years ago. Jotaro and Polnareff knew about the Arrows back then, and they knew they must have some importance due to their relation to Enya and Dio, but he did not know about the Arrows' power for sure until the events that occurred in Morio. After being approached by King Crimson, Sora Chariot is shown throwing Polnareff into the air. Back in Part 3, Chariot was unable to move Polnareff during the cream fight. This is quite simple. Earlier in Part 3, we were shown that Chariot is capable of holding up Polnareff, but while he was trapped by cream, he was bleeding out and gravely injured. While he is crippled in Part 5, this would not have nearly as much of an effect on his abilities as bleeding out would. The final fight revolves around getting a hold of the arrow, which upon piercing a stand will cause it to become Requiem. In the end, Giorno pierces Gold Experience and evolves his stand. However, back during the fight with Black Sabbath, Gold Experience briefly touched the arrow, but did not become a Requiem stand. I have seen this used quite a lot as an example of something that was forgotten. Some people have suggested that only the arrow with the beetle on it introduced later can grant Requiem stands. While this is the only arrow ever shown doing this, I don't think this is a sufficient explanation, since it is never directly stated. So here's a better explanation. It was shown in all examples that the Requiem transformation does not occur immediately. For Silver Chariot, after pricking its finger on the arrow and beginning its transformation, Polnareff was able to reverse it by taking the arrow away fast enough. Later, King Crimson is shown briefly touching the arrow, and the same Requiem smoke effect is seen. But Bucciarati destroying Chariot Requiem's light caused King Crimson to turn ethereal, making the arrow drop through him. Even though he had touched the arrow, he did not become a Requiem stand. Only sustained contact between the arrow and a stand can awaken Requiem. And that was everything for Part 5. While there were not as many topics as some of the previous parts, there was such a large amount to say about some of them that this video will still be close to the others in length. As with previous parts, Part 5 had an influx of new criticisms after the anime adaptation came out, including ones that are completely based on anime-only additions or changes. For the next video in this series, every topic will have to be taken from the manga. However, there's still going to be quite a lot to talk about. Join me next time when I debunk Araki Forgot in Part 6. If you want to be updated on progress of new videos or to leave suggestions, join the Haman Beat Discord server using the link in the description. Thank you for watching. This is the part of the video where I thank my $5 and $10 patrons. Thank you Norton the Lich. Thank you Alex Ramirez. Thank you Raziana. Thank you Boat Girl. Thank you Laura. Thank you Nax. Thank you Insane Penguin. And thank you Mr. Mister.